No, listen, let's not compare apples and oranges. We're talking about the U.S. media, and that's not fair. Mm -hmm. you know? If we want to talk about the Palestinian press, the first thing I would point out is the existence of the Israeli censor over my head every night when I had mm -hmm. to produce a newspaper. I could not tell what my front page was going to be 10 p.m. at night. I have had government officials in an Arab country sort of sidle up to me uh, privately and say, you know, don't worry, Mr. Begleiter, we know you're Jewish. It's difficult for television to portray very complex issues, and the Middle East is an example of a very complicated uh, set of circumstances and events that goes on all the time. Reporting the Middle East, a panel discussion from the International Media Studies Program of the Department of Communications at Brigham Young University. Moderating today's discussion is Program Director John Hughes, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and former editor of the Christian Science Monitor. I'm John Hughes. I'd like to welcome you to the campus of Brigham Young University. Our topic today is reporting the Middle East. The Middle East is clearly one of the most troubled regions of the world, and for Americans and for the people who live there, it's obviously uh, terribly critical. We want to look at the complex forces there as portrayed by the American press. How well do they explain what is going on there? How well do they capture the nuances of what is going on in the Middle East? When we talk about press, uh, we're talking about print, radio, television, and magazines. We're going to be all-inclusive. We are fortunate today to have gathered here three experts who are both media experts and Middle Eastern experts. And I would like to introduce first Akiba Cohen. Professor Cohen is a professor of communications at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's the former chairman of the Department of Communications and Journalism there. He's currently a visiting professor at American University in Washington, D.C., and the University of Maryland. Next to uh, Professor Cohen is Ralph Begleider, a very familiar face uh, on the, to, for those of you who watch CNN and who doesn't watch CNN these days. Uh, Mr. Begleider is uh, CNN's world affairs correspondent. He's based in Washington, D.C., but he travels the world. Uh, he's interviewed every world leader of prominence. He's also an expert in the area of arms negotiations. Uh, he's, uh, he got his undergraduate degree at Brown University. He got his master's degree in journalism at Columbia University. He started with television stations in Rhode Island, went on to television stations in Washington, D.C., and joined CNN 12 years ago. Uh, next to uh, Mr. Begbleiter is uh, Dr. Bishara Bahba. Uh, Dr. Bahba is a member of the Palestinian delegation to the multilateral peace talks. He's also a former editor of Palestinian newspapers in Jerusalem and in Washington. He's a graduate of Brigham Young University, got his master's degree and his doctoral degree at Harvard. And at Harvard, he is today associate director of the Institute for Social and Economic Policy in the Middle East. He's also president of his own international marketing company. He's active in many Palestinian causes and he's a frequent guest on national TV sh shows and uh, talk shows. Gentlemen, let me throw out a broad question to you to start with. How accurate do you think is the public perception in the United States of what is going on in the Middle East uh, perception as created by the American press? How, how close to reality are we? Professor Kahn. Well, I think the issue is, first of all, how closely do they follow the news? and how much does, or how well does the news reflect uh, the events on the ground, so to speak, and the correlation between those two things. I think that Americans typically are less interested in foreign news and foreign affairs than, say, Europeans, people living in the Middle East and other places. And I think that the media in the United States, particularly television, although you said you wanted to talk about uh, other media as well, since television is considered by many to be the main source, in fact, the title of a famous book on the subject, uh, the fact that television is the main source for most people's uh, information, television is very um, superficial. Television, I believe, is very... Uh, it, it finds it, it's difficult for television to portray very complex issues, and the Middle East is an example of a very complicated uh, set of circumstances and events that goes on all the time. And uh, as a result, it seems to me that if you study uh, public opinion, uh, knowledge, information that Americans seem to have of what is going on in the Middle East, it seems to me that much more is to be desired. 
Are you going to let him get away with that, Mr. Well, Beglider? Actually, actually, I am. I think, uh, I think in general he's right. I think Americans uh, get a kind of distorted view of what the Middle East is, on television and in print for that matter, uh, not because there's any intentional distortion going on, but I think uh, if you travel the region, you realize that it isn't all conflict. And I think uh, what people see around the world of the Middle East is the Arab-Israeli conflict. That isn't to say the conflict doesn't exist. Obviously, the conflict does exist, and there are very, very deep problems there, and it is very complex, Akiba, you're right. But uh, we never see, for example, or we rarely see in America how Syrians live, or how Jordanians live, or how Lebanese live. And for that matter, we rarely even see uh, how Israelis live outside of the confrontations that they have uh, among the Arabs and the Israelis. And in that sense, I think Americans have this perception of the Middle East as being a pot in which everything's boiling all the time. There's a lot of boiling going on there, but there are a lot of people carrying on daily lives as well. And there are a lot of people who can see their way out of the conflict, people on both the Arab and the Israeli side, I think. Are, are serious men and women in television attempting to do anything about this? I mean, it's a, it's a criticism that has been leveled at, uh, at television coverage in other parts of the world, too, that you, you guys focus your cameras on the on the, uh, the, on the conflict, the stone throwing, right. and a quarter mile away, life is proceeding peacefully. I, is, there any, is there any kind of thinking being done about how one could add perspective and depth to We get back, unfortunately, to the basic question of what is news. And uh, the, the old story about do you ever focus the camera on the cat that isn't caught up the tree? And the answer is no, you don't. It's not news. Um, should there be more programming about what life is like in a variety of places, not necessarily just the Middle East, but uh, look at the conflicts in Europe or the conflicts in the former Soviet Union? Yes, there should be more coverage of that sort. There should be more programming of that sort. But it isn't news. Uh, it's not news to say necessarily that uh, Israelis go to shopping malls that look very much like shopping malls in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, or that Syrian merchants conduct their business on a daily basis in a very ordinary and uh, familiar way, actually. Uh, those things are not news, but should we be doing more of that? Should people have a better perspective on the region? I think, I think the answer is yes, that should be the case. You asked if serious people are doing things like that. Yes, there are people doing uh, programming like that. Hard news programs like CNN even occasionally devote or focus that camera's lens on other parts of the, of the region or other aspects of it. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't make news. It doesn't capture headlines. It doesn't catch people's attention. And in the United States, as Akiba, I think, correctly pointed out, many Americans are not focused on world affairs. And when they see, here's a story about how everything is normal, they sort of tune out and say, oh, well, if it's normal, I don't need to pay attention. What about you, Dr. Bapa? Do you think we're capturing the reality of the, of the Middle East in the American press? Well, first of all, uh, I do agree with my co-panelists that there needs to be much more done in terms of coverage of the Middle East. That we agree on. What I would dispute is whatever existing coverage that takes place right now, from my perspective, it is not necessarily accurate, nor it is necessarily objective. For example, four weeks ago, the massacre in Hebron took place. That was February 25th. And since that time, we've heard so many stories about the massacre in Hebron. How many journalists have been allowed into Hebron to see what is going on? Hebron has been under curfew since February 25th. Whatever coverage we have seen thus far is mostly second-hand coverage or by phone. Now, if we were to take this as an example of media coverage of the Middle East in the United States, it's a dismal example. American journalists can only get into Hebron for a brief period of day. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, Hebron is under curfew, period. Uh, some Israeli journalists have been able to get in. I've read about one Palestinian journalist smuggling themselves in. Uh, but that's about it. I don't know how many, if at all, uh, Western journalists have been allowed into Hebron. But the fact that the media 
is not making an issue about not being able to get into Hebron is an important issue in and of itself. I, suspe I, I suspect the media is making this. So wouldn't your, well, your crews be yeah, agitating? Uh, we're trying all the time to get in. In some cases, we've been able to get in. Some cases through a ruse. Some cases through uh, being allowed to get in. But I just want to make just the brief point that you're, you may be right about that in terms of the details of what happened in Hebron. But the fact of the matter is that in the context of the Middle East, there are two stories about Hebron. One is what happened at Hebron. The other story is what impact does the, do the events of Hebron have on everything else going on? And most of the coverage has been about what impact is it going to have on everything else? There will come a time, I'm sure, when the details of what happened at Hebron will, will come out. And I have no doubt that uh, American news organizations will report them in great detail when the information is available. In the meantime, we report on what is available. Dr. Dr. Kahn, you well, I, I think an, a few points need to be said here. First of all, the, the curfew in Hebron is not because of journalists. The curfew has been imposed because of the situation in the city, uh, given this extraordinary, terrible event. I, I that never happened. implied it was. Yeah, but that okay. wasn't the point. Yeah, okay. The point yeah. wasn't that it was deliberately okay. to exclude no. journalists. Okay, but. If there is a curfew, then it also is, prevents journalists from roaming the city and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Not that I'm supporting the idea of a curfew. Second, I think that the fact that, as, as, as Ralph has just said, there has been reference to the uh, censorship, if you will, which is a related issue. Just the other day, there was a story in the New York Times about uh, uh, the event that I think happened two or three days ago where an 18-hour battle took place, uh, which was censored. Now, if we talk later about censorship, which we might, uh, there is a problem with censorship which ties into the, uh, to this whole general issue, which I think journalists themselves understand, uh, and, and Americans don't seem to understand that. Um, and I think that uh, we have to take into account the situation on the ground. Uh, what I'm pleased, and I, do, I don't represent any official Israeli organization or, or government, of course, in, the, in this context, but what I'm pleased to say is that the Palestinians have agreed to appear before the commission of inquiry after they uh, at first decided that they would not testify before the commission which was set up uh, and I think that you must give credit to the fact that the commission of this nature has been set up uh, assuming well, that you know the situation the way Israel deals with these kinds of yeah. events this was an extraordinary kind what of what I'm displeased with is the way that the Palestinian appearance before that committee was treated by the US media Mm -hmm. You don't think it was given adequate coverage? No, let me tell you what the Washington Post did a few days ago. The headline essentially says Palestinians uh, appear before the commission and uh, the judges uh, doubt the Palestinian story. I mean, immediately, doubt was injected into whatever the Palestinians had to say. So what would Palestinians do? My recommendation to the Palestinians would be don't appear before the panel. Well, if you read the bottom line or the next few paragraphs in that report, which I read myself, it said that they, they expressed doubt, but then the reason and the questions that the judges or the, the, the members of the committee uh, asked these witnesses was, why is there a discrepancy w between what you're telling us now and what you told well, the, I, my the point investigators here is that the emphasis was on putting doubt into what the Palestinians mm -hmm. said. Yeah, but this in, all is fairness, where I in all fairness, yeah. the coverage has also emphasized the, the doubt of the Israeli testimony as well. In mm -hmm. fact, the first two weeks of testimony in that hearing have been filled with contradictions um, within the Israeli testimony. And I think the point, the point that's important there is that the media picked up on that and did and did, did not do anything to try to squelch the idea that there was controversy within the, among Israelis who were on the scene. You know, the concept of doubt brings me to another point in reference to what you said earlier. You talked about the need for objective journalism. And I think that journalists, if they have not done so by now, they should forget about the term objectivity. You know and I know that there's Fair, no such fairness thing. Fairness might be better. Fairness, perhaps, but no, there is no such thing as objectivity. Well, I, I agree and with that definition. And three people or two people see the event and they see it differently and they report it differently. And as time goes by and the more times they report it, they tell it differently. And I think students of journalism are aware of this by now. So that you cannot expect, and journalists themselves, there's no journalist who sees the same event as another, as a colleague, as a colleague does. So that... Uh, I think you're talking about an ideal situation which no one has really attained. Now the audience also, and I think this is a very important perspective, the audience also is a very subjective bunch or group of people and audiences see things differently and I think if I may cite an, a, a wonderful example, 
You all remember in the, during the course of the Lebanese war in the 80s, there was the Sabra and Shatila massacre in Lebanon. And a study was done here in the United States by s several social psychologists published in one of the most esteemed uh, journals of social psychology, in which they took footage of American coverage of that particular event, showed it to a group of American Palestinians or Palestinians living in America and Israelis living in America and asked them to assess how they perceive that particular footage. And lo and behold, both groups perceived it as being biased against their position. So it's, well, that comes so back what is to, it? That comes back to John's original question, which was, are the mm -hmm. American people getting a really? fair picture or an accurate picture of what's going on? But it's more than that. And they the perceive may, things subjectively. Well, the answer may be that they're perceiving one thing from reading one publication and another thing from watching some other television station. If Americans paid more attention to the news and read and watched a broader array of sources, they might come away with a more accurate view of what's going on there uh, because of the perceived absence of objectivity or the differences of perceptions about one report or the other. Well, let, let me ask you about the possibility of bias on the part of American journalists. Um, Zev Shafet was uh, director of the uh, Israeli Information Department I, I, a few years ago, and uh, in his book Double Vision, he says, uh, late in 1983, during the siege of Tripoli, Chairman Yasser Arafat called one of his almost daily press conferences for days. Arafat's supporters have been cut off in the Lebanese port city, battered by Syrian-sponsored Palestinian rebels led by Abu Musa, and no one knew how much longer Arafat would be able to hold out. The PLO chief was facing both an irreparable split in his organization and a military defeat that would rob him of his last foothold in Lebanon. And yet, as the press conference began, Arafat seemed in a mellow mood. Looking out over the assembled journalists, some of whom he'd known for years, he nostalgically recalled the siege of Beirut six, 16 months earlier. I still remember the most important battalion I had with me then, he told them. It was the battalion from the Commodore, the Commodore Hotel, a reference to the Foreign Press Corps and its headquarters in West Beirut. The PLO's warm, almost proprietary attitude toward the Foreign Press Corps did not begin in the summer of 1982. For almost a decade, the Western press had been one of Arafat's most formidable allies. During that time, the Commodore Battalion provided the PLO with often uncritical press coverage in the gentle phrase of the New York Times is Thomas Friedman. However, well, let me quote from Edward Said's book, well-known uh, Palestinian scholar at Columbia, who looked at the same question of bias and said, for the general public in America and Europe today, Islam is news of a particularly unpleasant sort. The media, the government, the geopolitical strategists, and although they're marginal to the culture at large, the academic experts on Islam are all in concert. Islam is a threat to Western civilization. Here's one distinguished commentator saying the American press is in the, in the pocket of PLO. Here's another one saying they don't write anything good about that. Well, actually, I'd, I'd like to see what your reaction is to some of that, because I think there are many Palestinians who feel that the American press has devoted too much or perhaps too exclusive information and attention to Yasser Arafat and his portion of the Palestinian world, particularly now in the, in the last six months or so since the signing of the agreement in Washington. I think many people have begun to question whether we in the media are adequately giving attention to the many factions, the many diverse opinions within the Palestinian community, not necessarily focusing all of our attention on Yasser Arafat? Well, uh, I mean, it, it's hard for me to answer this question. Obviously, Yasser Arafat represents uh, the Palestinians and Palestine. Uh, I mean, he might not have 90% popularity among Palestinians, but he is still the predominant Palestinian leader. If the press... Is it because of the absence of anyone else. He's the most predominant leader, yes. Now, if the press chooses to, to uh, focus on people with opposing viewpoints, let them do so. I mean, that's not a, that is not something that I would oppose or the Arafat would oppose himself. But, but even going back to the issue of perceptions, uh, also, probably the two of you have seen uh, um, a cartoon by Herblock in the Washington Post recently in which he showed a Palestinian uh, uh, individual touting a gun and an Israeli touting another gun and they're pointing their guns at an olive branch and in one he says, 
Palestinian terrorist, and the other, he says, Jewish fanatic. Now, don't tell me that's not biased. How come the Palestinian is a terrorist while the Jew is not a terrorist as well, or well, vice versa? You know? So that is part of the inherent bias that I see in the Western press against Palestinians and Arabs. You don't think there's been a shift in, in the past several years? It seems to me we have traditionally had a uh, very sympathetic attitude towards Israel in this country. You don't think the intifada, the, the, uh, the photographs of the stone throwing uh, by unarmed Palestinians on the one hand and the, the problem of the pictures of uh, uh, pretty tough, heavily armed Israeli soldiers uh, going after Palestinian civilians. Do you think that has shifted? I think that, at it, all? that there is more sympathy and understanding among Americans today than there was six years ago of the Palestinians and the Arabs in general. I, I don't doubt that. Uh, what I would like to see is not an improvement, but a level where I would perceive that the coverage is an even-handed coverage. And I agree with you. There is no such thing as an objective coverage of anything. We cannot be objective, period. Okay? But at the same time, but part, of the, part of the reason why that is the case is because I believe, in, to a large extent, the US media is an establishment media. It, it really hesitates to criticize the official position of the government, unless it's Whitewater and it's a different issue. Okay? But, oh, well. but in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's an establishment media. And it's not willing to poke into the official line of the government, at least not on a consistent basis, but simply takes the official government position. The of US course, government. the Palestinian press is. Is what? Is not a government press. Is, is no, w listen, l let's not compare apples and oranges. We're talking about the US media, and mm -hmm. that's not fair. Mm -hmm. you know? If we want to talk about the Palestinian press, the first thing I would point out is the existence of the Israeli censor over my head every night when I had mm -hmm. to produce a newspaper. I could not tell what my front page was going to be 10 p.m. at night. You know? He was the editor-in-chief, and I was working for him as editor-in-chief. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can talk. I mean, the, the Israeli media might be a democratic media for its uh, own constituencies, but it certainly is not for Palestinians or even others. John, there's been a shift also in the sympathies, I think, if you want to call it sympathies in the American press, also because there's been a shift in the face the Palestinians have put to the rest of the world in the last few years. And it... Uh, well, some might say it started a little before the Madrid Peace Conference, but many, would, many, I think, Americans anyway, only became aware of it in connection with coverage of that conference when to many Americans for the first time, and I, I don't know if you'd agree with this or not, but I think many Americans for the first time at that conference discovered that the Palestinians, the Palestinian people were somebody else or somebody broader than Yasser Arafat with a gun. Uh, for many Americans until that moment, Yasser Arafat carrying a gun was the image of the Palestinian people, and that changed uh, when a number of Palestinians who were perceived in the United States as rational, uh, willing to engage in debate, uh, willing to engage in negotiations, and so on, suddenly came to prominence because of the Madrid conference. Now, disagree, I mean, I don't no, know if you disagree I, with that, but I that's agree. another reason for the shift, and I think yes, it's an important one. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make two points about what you said, though, before. One is that it, it depends on how you look at, at news coverage. If you look at news coverage on a per item or per newscast or per day basis, then you may be correct in identifying some very extraordinary cases of bias in one way or another. But if you look, as we do, as social scientists who study the media do, at the overall, over time analysis, and when we carefully examine frame by frame or, or text by text, which no viewer does, it's me and my colleagues who are the crazy people who watch news again and again and again. Okay? Uh, the normal viewer sees it once if he pays attention at all. And the impression that you get when you do a very careful analysis over time, and some of that is reflected in the, in, in the book that John mentioned earlier, is the fact that there is a very even-handed, or there was, say, regarding the Intifada, a very even-handed coverage if you look at the analysis over time and frame by frame. Let me just give you an example. There were claims made that uh, all the, well, depending on who made the claims, some made the claims that people only saw the soldiers shooting at the Palestinians. Others made the claim that all you saw was the Palestinians throwing stones. Now, our analysis of the frames and what we called flip-flops, going back and forth, 
showed that it was almost per perfectly balanced. And the reason or the, the explanation after the fact that we gave is that we were convinced that media people, that journalists, that producers were aware of the fact that they would have been attacked very severely if they didn't have this even-handed uh, overtime presentation, which they did. Now, the second point I want to make is that... But, but excuse me, but what you're saying is that the public didn't perceive... The public doesn't perceive the overtime thing. The public catches on or, or focuses on a particular incident. I mean, the, the Intifada has had hundreds of incidents. If you asked, uh, I'm just out, you know, verbalizing out loud now what I would think the public would say, if you asked them, what are the memorable events that you have of the Intifada which began uh, in December of 1987? They will tell you Hebron, which is right now, whether or not they would say it's linked to the Intifada or not, probably yes. They will talk about the Temple Mount. They may talk about a few others. We did a paper, we did a study on, a, on an event that happened in April of 1989, early in the Intifada at a village called Nachalin, outside, outside of Bethlehem. We wrote a paper, and I'm not saying that what we did is, is the state of the art, but we wrote, a, we wrote a paper called One of the Bloodiest Days. It was then defined by the media as being one of the bloodiest days. Four people were killed that day. Since then, it's not one of the bloodiest days at all. It's nothing in comparison. But what, I'm, what I want to say is that the frame, and I like to use the term, the frame in which the media present stories is, one of the frames is the victim frame. And the Palestinians now are the victims. There was a time, when you talked earlier about terrorism, there was a time that Israelis were victims, much more so. Now the Palestinians are perceived as the victims, and I believe that the media present them in that kind of a frame. And that's why people may perceive them as such. Let me make a comment on this analysis of over time. I think many people, if they watched how news were, was actually produced, would be shocked to discover the kind of chaotic way in which it is presented, both in print and in broadcast. And it may be nice to go back and look at uh, the long uh, time frame and, and see whether things are fairly presented and whether they're balanced and so on. But it's my contention that very few people in the, in the journalistic community actually look at it that way. They see things in a day-by-day -day mm -hmm. context. And I think that's a credit to the journalism community because I think what your point proves is that over a period of time, without necessarily thinking about it, the, the fair-minded and, generally speaking, uh, capable journalistic community comes up with an overall fair and balanced product. I, I agree with you. Uh, it's not because we sat down and said in 365 days we have to have a certain number of reports that tilt this way and a certain number of reports that tilt that way. I absolutely you know, agree. I it's the role of the professors I to do that. I think that both gentlemen here have switched their initial position from uh, when you asked the initial question about... That you must have been very persuasive. And no, no, no. We were talking no, no, about accuracy. Actually, we were talking I about agreed accuracy. with them first, but I don't agree with them now. Okay. Uh, so I might have been the opposite of that. Uh, at first, you were critical of the, at least, of the coverage of the U.S. media and its impact. At least that's the impression I got. And now you seem to be both satisfied. No, but wait a minute. We were talking oh. about an actual. The original question was about whether Americans get an accurate picture of the Middle East. And at least my point, anyway, was overall, if you look at the Middle East through the media, you think it's all conflict. And you and I, all three of us, know that's not the case. Now we're talking about something different. We're talking about a specific incident. You're talking about focusing on the conflict part of the story. Are we being fair about it? That's different than saying, are we and getting an one does not impression? have a relationship to the other, in your opinion? No, one does not have a, a relationship to the other. You're getting an inaccurate overall impression of the Middle East. But if you focus on one part of the Middle East to which most of the attention is given, I think you're getting a basically fair account of the conflict of the day, of the conflict. Let me, let me ask you a bit uh, about the difficulties that American newsmen, fa newsmen and women face in, in, in trying to cover um, the Middle East. I go back to Mr. Chavitz's book. Uh, the Middle East is an enormous region roughly the size of Europe, which except for Israel is covered by a tiny handful of American journalists, fewer in fact than the number of sports writers at the New York Daily News. Most of these reporters can't speak the local languages or even read the newspapers. They usually bring little or no background to the complex events that they're expected to cover. Even under ideal circumstances, it would be physically impossible for such a small band of journalists, most of whom concentrate on the same stories, to simultaneously cover more than 20 countries in a region and milieu they do not fully understand 
and the conditions under which foreign journalists are forced to work in the Arab world are far from ideal. Ralph, uh, how about the difficulties? Uh, physical threats to physical well-being, are they not? Uh, well, there are all kinds of difficulties. I, I would just first briefly just point out that I don't think this is limited to a problem that's limited to the Middle East. I think some of these difficulties are available all around the world, and we have to confront them and deal with them. In the Middle East, you have one really big problem, and that is it is not easy for journalists to travel between the Arab world and the Israeli world. And if they do travel, as many American journalists do, then when they get to one place or the other, they are somehow perceived as being suspect in, in some way. Uh, and I know this from personal experience. Um, I, have had, I have had government officials in an Arab country sort of sidle up to me uh, privately and say, you know, don't worry, Mr. Begleiter, we know you're Jewish. Um, that's all they would say. Well, of course, then you begin worrying. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to be facetious about it, but I, I do think that it is a problem just not being able to travel freely. Not being able to get into some countries. Not being able to get into some countries. It's very difficult to get into Iran, for example, and when you do get into Iran, you are very carefully monitored and observed and in some cases led around essentially by the nose as to what you can cover and what you can't cover. Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is the same way. Uh, I wouldn't say it's quite as restrictive as Iran, but it's pretty restrictive. Uh, there are some places where the situation is much better. Egypt is much better than that. Jordan is much better than that. And Syria, believe it or not, is becoming much better than that. Uh, in the last two or three years, Syria has changed its approach to international journalists, and you're seeing a lot more You can get into Syria, but can you operate there as a journalist? It's difficult to operate there. I mean, you have a much more government-oriented society. You have, it's much more difficult to get people outside the government to speak with you honestly and to appraise the political situation uh, in a straightforward way, but it's getting easier and more people are willing to take the risk these days. And you can actually get information out of Syria now that it was difficult to get out before. Uh, just recently, for example, the Syrian government has opened up, I'm just giving an example to people who may not be familiar with all this, they've allowed fax machines to be widespread in Syria. Well, remember the role the fax machines played in Eastern Europe and in Moscow and the former China. Soviet Union and in China. So this is not a small development. Uh, but yeah, the difficulties, the difficulties are enormous. And something I'd, I think I'd mention along this line, although we're talking about the American media, I think it would do wonders in the Middle East if Israeli journalists and Arab journalists were able to circulate around the region instead of being isolated in their, on their own camp in covering the conflict. I'm not suggesting anybody would change their opinion about who's right or who's wrong, but I think it would just do wonders for the kind of coverage and public opinion formation in places like Israel in Jordan, in Egypt, well, if people were able to Can I circuit. comment on this? There Please. have been in the last few months several reports by Israeli journalists who got into various Arab countries, right. uh, either in official channels or unofficially, some even masqueraded in some way or another. And uh, I think this phenomenon uh, is beginning. It's beginning, it's, and it's, it's, it's beginning. very healthy. Yeah. Uh, I also, as far as I know, uh, Israel would admit Arab journalists if they wanted to come. Uh, yeah, but we're not no, talking about government no, right, regulations right. necessarily. No, no, we're the, talking the, about the milieu that but, prevents the travel. But the problem travel. is that Arab journalists don't either don't have the interest at this point in time, or their papers or, or organizations have not sent them. But as far as I know, there have been very few, except for Egyptians, of course, who have come and covered events in Israel. Yeah, there's one more factor, and that is the uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the personal embarrassment factor or mm -hmm. whatever. I've spoken with Israeli journalists, I mean uh, Egyptian journalists, who say. I'd love to go to Israel and cover, but you know, I, I just can't do it. I, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, couldn't do it and come back and work here anymore. And do well, that's it. unfortunate. So that's not a government thing. It's sort of just a, an atmospheric almost. Let, let me ask Bashar if, if this freedom of movement is going to, in fact, take place after, after the peace accords. Are we going to see, for example, a flourishing of the Palestinian press? Um, the Palestinian press is really in a unique situation. Um, Certainly, it's not in an ideal uh, situation, uh, uh, not now, and it's going to take a lot of work to make the Palestinian press an independent press in the sense that all of us here understand what an independent press is and sh what it should do as well. Uh, in terms of the movement of the press, I think that uh, certainly many Arab countries have started to open up. I mean, Tunisia right now allows Israeli journalists to come and go as they wish. Uh, 
with very few restrictions. Other Arab countries are opening up slowly. Uh, in principle, I, I would like to state here for the record that I'm fully supportive of open borders and free press. Uh, open borders, uh, I'm not talking politically, but in the political sense, I think once we have uh, a peace settlement, I, I, I presume that we're going to, I assume we're going to have normal relations between the various countries of the region. Uh, I think it is very important for the Arabs to have uh, freedom of the press. Uh, it is very important for governments to get out of the business of supporting the press, and which in turn suppresses what gets said and what does not. Um, the, now, having said that, uh, I think that uh, uh, Israel's treatment of the Palestinian press needs to be addressed. And, and will be, you think? Uh, it will be. Right now, the, uh, it will be, I believe. Uh, but at the present time, the only Palestinian press is in existence in East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That's, and the only press available is actual uh, print press. There there's no a radio. television station that has begun. It's just beginning. It is yeah. just beginning. And there, uh, there is a, uh, a media authority that the PLO has put together in, uh, equal to... Uh, Which the Israelis have in recent months allowed to go, to go ahead. Yes. Yeah, but uh, that's the problem. Well, okay. yeah. I mean, Bashar would say, yeah, but why should the Israelis be the ones to allow that? Well, but, but, as, long, okay, now, but as long as there is a military occupation, which, which right now is the case, obviously well, the Israelis I, have to grant or not grant permission for these yes, things to Yes, I think that uh, it will do everyone, uh, everyone will be better off uh, if, even while uh, Israel is in control of the occupied territories, to let the press have a free hand, the Palestinian press have a free hand. Uh, right now, everything is censored. Absolutely everything is censored. Because this is for American correspondents, too. No, no. Well, this no, is for the Palestinians. No, there is censorship for American correspondents, but yeah. it is nowhere near no, as exactly. tightly enforced yeah. as it is for Palestinians. There's also censorship for Israeli correspondents. Right. There is censorship okay. for all reporters but, operating but, but, out but of Israel. But a couple of days ago in the New York Times, uh, Associated Press story, violent fighting broke out today between Palestinians and Israeli soldiers in Hebron. Arab journalists said a Palestinian was killed by army gunfire. A Palestinian, who was 34 years old and pregnant, died instantly, the journalist said. The fighting began when a curfew was lifted briefly so residents could buy food. The UN Relief and Works Agency also said Israeli soldiers had seized two United Nations officers in a refugee camp northwest of Nablus, forced them to the ground, handcuffed them, and dragged them out of the camp. A uh, little italic precede on that story, this report was submitted to Israeli censors who ordered deletions. Okay, so, you, you know, what, what annoys me about this particular report, and I saw this and I actually referred to that earlier, is the fact that every report is submitted to the censor in Israel. But not everyone but not is everyone subject everyone to deletions. deletions. Everyone is subject to, that doesn't mean that they usually do. They usually no, don't no, delete anything. Right. So when they delete, they make a note, they of, make it. A note of it. And that should be. Okay, uh, that's fine. Know. But, but the point but that is... One, that one doesn't seem to relate to military operations, though. the censorship here. Israeli censorship is not exclusively related to military operations. operations. Israeli censorship has a much broader base than that. Uh, it's not just limited to it that. It covers everything. Yeah. We had to submit headlines, pictures, advertisements, you name it. In, in the case of Palestinian press, yes. the argument going there, you see, I, I think we're sort of making it too, look too simple. The, the issue is much more complex than that. In the case of Palestinian press, again, you can't change the facts. The facts are that Palestinians are presently under Israeli military occupation. And as such, uh, and I don't want to say we have a great occupation, but the fact is that there is press. But on the other hand, they are censored. And, uh, and I think you couldn't really expect the press to be entirely free under a military government, okay? The fact is that there is such censorship. Now, the censorship applies to Israeli press as well. But let me give you the, the, the most recent example of two days ago, this 18-hour battle that was going on, uh, which was reported here to have been under, under censorship and not being allowed to re be reported in Israel as well. I pick up Israeli radio on shortwave, and the same thing was true, was true there. The rationale is that as long as certain military activities are going on, you don't want to reveal the actual events. Now, I always wonder as an Israeli, and I can't separate the fact that I don't think anybody, you're not separating the fact that you're Palestinian from your, from, your, from your academic or from your professional views as well. I think that it's impossible to 
not see the context in which these things are happening. Because when the United States uh, is engaged in some kind of military activity and the press are reporting ahead of time that division such and such is flying to Europe to do this and that, and then they fail in their mission, you know, you wonder. Now, the American press doesn't seem to have that kind of quote-unquote responsibility. The Israeli yeah, press... Not by, by government edict, but by, by responsibility within the news organization. Within the news does. organization towards its own quote-unquote or not quote-unquote national concerns. Okay. There is a national security concern that the United States also has. Mm -hmm. And the United States is involved in many places around the world. And I sometimes think, and I'm for as much as for freedom of the press as I think anybody sitting around this table or in this room, uh, I think that there are times when the consideration ought to be different. If people's lives are at stake, you sometimes have to keep your mouth shut. But during the Gulf War, the United States used feeding the press in order to misguide that's the... Some, that's that's right. disinformation kind of and that's something yeah. different. No, I, I that's something that. totally I mean, different. It's, you're saying that it is critical not to publish security-related information. During the time that it is relevant. Okay, but I mean, uh, the government was able to utilize this, this uh, mm -hmm. outlet in order to... Uh, mislead mm -hmm. the enemy per se yeah. so I mean it's a, it's a yeah. two edged well the mechanism the way it works in the United States I believe is that the, there are there are top there are classified documents which the government which the Pentagon will not release to the press the press would love to have those documents and it's the onus on the Pentagon to refrain from letting the press get a hold of them but the press doesn't say in any, at any point in time that the government or the Pentagon should not have secret plans and secret operations that's what the military establishment yeah. is all about. Can, 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 I just, uh, can I just do a real quick footnote right. on the Palestinian press before we right. leave that subject? I happen to believe that if and when there's a settlement between Israel and the Palestinians, the Palestinian press will turn out to be about the best kind of journalists mm -hmm. there are in the Arab world. Because I think many members of the Palestinian press have, have done enough traveling and enough observation to discover that the kind of media that exists uh, you know, let's say within the PLO or whatever, and the, certainly the kind of media that exists in many Arab countries is not what they have in mind for their future uh, entity, whatever it may be. That's all. Okay, as, as this question of national interest has come up, let me ask you, Ralph, first, and, uh, and then the uh, two other panelists, what about this charge that American correspondents, not only in the Middle East, but, uh, but in the world at large, are too close to American diplomats? Uh, have one correspondent in the Middle East covering 20 countries, as, as we've just uh, heard. Uh, got lots of American diplomats on the ground. Uh, one of the first ports of call when you hit a new country is... Hit the American, hit embassy. The American embassy. Absolutely. How and about I'll this Well, this first problem? of all, I'll tell you why that happens. And, and it's important for people to remember this. The United States has served as a broker. I won't use the phrase honest broker, although both Israelis and Arabs use the phrase honest broker to describe the United States. Israel, Jews and Arabs in the Middle East go to the United States for resolution of problems. It's been traditional in the region. They go to the United States. Likewise, journalists go to the United States to see, so what's cooking? Doesn't mean the journalists who go to visit the American embassy first are going to buy hook, line, and sinker everything the American ambassador says in Damascus or in, in Jordan or wherever. Uh, on the contrary, it's, a, it's trying to get a lay of the land. What have the Arabs been telling you lately, Mr. Ambassador? What have the Israelis been telling you lately? And what's the guidance you're getting from Washington about how this particular issue is going to be resolved? Then any good journalist obviously will go and interview sources in both the Arab and the Israeli world and try to make a report that's, that's, that's honest about what's going on. But I think it's important for journalists to stay in close touch with people who are intimately involved in the conflict and the process for its resolution. And for better or for worse, at the selection of the Arabs and Israelis, the United States has been closely involved in that. Do you have a view on that? Well, Professor I'd like to be a little bit more general. Yes, uh, I think that the problem with some journalists, and I hope you'll forgive me for saying this, is that they're very gullible, and that if they get information, or if they seem to be getting information from whatever source it happens to be, they'll be very pleased to get that information and to use that information. So obviously the embassy of the country which they are citizens of would be very likely to provide them with information. Uh, we did a study, this is a long time ago, a study during the Yom Kippur War, 1973, where we found that the more different sources provided information, the more credible those 
those sources were perceived, whether it was the man in the street, and often the man in the street can, can provide very interesting information, or whether it was diplomats or whether it was army generals. So it doesn't really matter who the source is, if the source is willing to provide or to seem as if he is providing information, journalists are very happy with that. And I think that's something not always to the credit of the journalists, particularly in times of crisis, when many journalists are flown in uh, to, to aid, to, to complement the resident foreign correspondents who know the material, who are familiar, who have the real context. But these so-called strangers who come in don't know the territory, don't have the contacts. Parachute journalists. Parachute journalists who come in whenever there's a crisis. Uh, I think the problem is mainly with those and not with the, the because they run off to the embassy. They run off to whoever was yeah, going to. Just for the record, though, I think everybody ought to know that when an American journalist, particularly a prominent American journalist, comes into a region, whether it's the Middle East or any place else, not only does the American embassy provide that journalist with information, so other, but so, so do all other parties, because right. all other parties know that American journalists have the ability to get the information mm -hmm. out, sometimes circumventing censorship if that's necessary mm -hmm. and so on. And second of all, have a large and influential audience that's influential not only in terms of public opinion, but influential on the government that in this case is being asked to mediate. So, right. you know, the Arabs, the Israelis, you can go to Jordan and King Hussein will brief people like the likes of me, uh, you go into Israel and Prime Minister Rabin will brief the likes of me. I mean, and of course you get the information from the American Embassy as well, mm -hmm. but it's not limited to that sort. No, I agree. And, and cross-check with the embassies of other countries, of course. too. There's certain countries that are, have... When you go to Damascus, you respect. check in with the Russian Embassy. Sure. It's very important. Right. It's always been important, and it's a natural thing to do. You, you talked about journalists flying in and out. Do you agree? Don't even... Uh, there, are very many, there are many very good journalists, American journalists, covering the Middle East but they tend not to stay there for a long time. It seems to me that Euro the European, the French, and the British correspondents tend to develop longer-term regional experts. Now, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't investigated this specifically, but I know that in the case of Israel, you have people like Paul, uh, Bob, Simon. Bob Simon, who's been there for years. Martin Fletcher has been there for years. Uh, the ABC, uh, Reynolds has been there for years. Some of them are married to local people. They have kids going to school there. So uh, I'm not sure that that's the case. I think that there are people who have been there for a long time. Because the other think, side of that coin is that they've become too identified with the That is a company, problem. Now, now, also, many of these uh, uh, companies, including CNN, have lo Israelis who work for that's them. Right. Uh, Kessel, for Yoram Kessel in Jerusalem, who works for CNN, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine. Uh, these are Israelis who serve in the Israeli army, who are schizophrenic in this sense, by the way, vis-a-vis -vis the censorship and the military spokesperson, because one day they're reporting for CNN, and the next day they're serving in the army as their reserve duty, working, say, with the spokesman or with the censorship. With the censorship. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> because these people know how to deal with the press, so they, they have this dual, very complex kind of role, and, and that's difficult for them to, to do. That's why the problem of parachute journalism is, is a real, fairly complex one that can get you into a long discussion. It's not just the journalist who flies in overnight, pops in on the ground, and suddenly five hours later he's on the air or writing a big piece in the New York Times. That isn't really the way it works. Most of the time there's a lot of local help, there's a lot of input and research that goes into those pieces. But you know, is one it, thing I'd like to make uh, you can ask, is also it, it's one thing to have a reporter file that report and by the time it gets to the editor, wherever the source is, I mean, the story can change. A headline can change the story. And this is where, I, that's a point I think that we have to keep in mind, is that uh, you might have one story from a reporter that gets translated or edited uh, uh, differently at headquarters, and so the people seeing it or reading it don't necessarily get uh, fairly uh, or the, the exact or the accurate impression that the reporter wants. But that's true of all the problem, the problem That's of, true. The problem yeah, that's of the point. headlines that do not reflect the story is not peculiar yeah. to the Middle East. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Ralph, is it, more, uh, is it more difficult for American news organizations to employ Arab stringers in Arab countries? You say you employ Israelis. Oh, no. We have uh, CNN has a bureau in Amman. CNN has a bureau in Cairo. Uh, we employ... Uh, They're not under greater pressure under greater pressure to from their governments? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I can tell you that in Jordan, um, I think most journalists are under some pressure of the government. 
uh, I think anyone you hire in Saudi Arabia would be under a fair amount of pressure from the government. I think it's much less so in Egypt. Uh, but in Egypt, as I tried to explain earlier, it's not so much government pressure as it is sort of a, an atmospheric thing about n not being uh, anti-government. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, anyone who lives anywhere and who, who grows up anywhere and whose life is anchored somewhere has a certain sympathy for that country. But a good journalist takes that into account as you gather, the, collect the information and sift it together with whatever else you've got. Just picking up on Bashar's uh, point that the journalist operating from a foreign country is somewhat a d disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis his head office because uh, people do terrible things to a story, people write <laughs> lousy headlines. Do Washington correspondents covering foreign policy have more heft than foreign correspondents in the field? Is that a problem? Some, uh, I, think, I think Washington correspondents think they have more heft. <laughs> I'm not sure they necessarily do. <laughs> We do t two different kinds of reporting, John. I think that's important to remember. The correspondent on the ground in Jerusalem or on the ground in Amman has a certain story. It's the story of what has happened in Hebron or what has happened in some incident there or what the political situation is on the ground. The Washington correspondent, generally speaking, doesn't do that kind of story. The Washington correspondent puts that into the context of what else is going on. Did the Russians weigh in? What did the Americans say about it? Is anybody sending troops or money or planes or support from the outside? And that all gets sifted into uh, maybe you might call it a bigger picture piece or a context piece that's done by a correspondent in Washington who has been able to observe in a way that on the ground correspondents are unable to do so events in various different places around the globe. Let me, let me ask you, Bashar, how you feel about coverage of the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. We've had, we had bombings, we've had terrorism, World Trade Center, and do you, do you think that the American press has offered, I mean, a lot of writers I read on this subject say um, it is not, of course it is very unpleasant in the case of acts of terrorism, but it is not as critical a factor as it is made out to be in the American press. Is that? Uh, well, I, I tend to agree with that assessment that Islamic fundamentalism uh, was blown out of proportion, particularly when the Soviet Union started collapsing. It seems that the world, or the, the United States, and by extension Israel, or vice versa in terms of that relationship, needed to create an enemy that they can, that they can pound. And Islamic fundamentalism became the enemy. All of a sudden, uh, we, we were reading stories about uh, Sudan was being taken over by Islamic fundamentalism, Algeria, and so on. Not that they were not, but then the... the the, the important point, by the some, way. Some small, yeah. A small yeah. important yeah. detail. No, <laughs> the, the point here is that I believe that the, what was happening in Sudan, Algeria, was fairly blown out of proportion to serve a purpose, and that is to show the Americans the danger of Islamic fundamentalism. And I don't think that that was a warranted scare on, on the part of the media to do. Now, the other thing I would like to mention, and that is, uh, I was reading recently and uh, public opinion polls, and about 40% of Americans uh, view Muslims, quote unquote, or Islam as a terroristic religion, which actually uh, surprised me. Uh, and, and I don't know if you saw a story recently, but. But I mean, that's, that's a serious verdict on Islam. And that is not true. I mean, it's, it might be true that Muslims were the ones that planted the bomb at the World Trading Center, but that does not make, make every Muslim a terrorist, nor does Baruch Goldstein make every Israeli a terrorist. And, and that is a serious problem as far as Islam is concerned. It's highly misperceived by the American public. And I don't think that the media is doing its job in terms of informing the I've, public I've, about uh, it. I've triggered a, obviously triggered a uh, discussion on the subject, which is uh, material for an entirely new panel. But sadly, we are coming to the end of our time on this particular topic. So I thank you for adding light to the subject. Thank you all for being with us. I'm John Hughes for the International Media Studies Program in the Department of Communications at Brigham Young University. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.